Kalal Yisrael is wallowing in crisis. We have so much confusion. We see calamity, tragedy, suffering, illness. We saw three Tyra, Halig and Hashemos, of Gila Michael, Ayal, and Yaakov Naftali. Three precious boys, kidnapped and brutally murdered. And we go through life. We see what goes on in the world. And we say to the Rabbanshom, Ayeka, where are you? And the Rabbanshom may answer back to us. You Jewish people, Bli Ayin Ha, you're so smart. You're so informed. You're so intelligent. You're so knowledgeable. Don't you get it? It's so simple. It's so elementary. What's so simple? What's so elementary? So let's examine history. The first chasm, the first rift, the first breach and dichotomy and division in Jewish history amongst the Jewish people from our very beginning was when Yosef HaTzadik's brothers kidnap him and sell him into slavery. Now, of course, they had every rationalization, they had every justification. He was trying to usurp the royal rights of Malucha from Yehuda. He was trying and attempting to wrest away the firstborn rights of Reuven. He was nar, he was immature, he was a rebel rouser. They had every justification rationalization, but as great philosophers have said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and they were wrong, not only wrong, but dead wrong, because for posterity, for eternity, we are suffering for their crime, the almost irreparable damage, the colossal error of the brothers causing a breach in the achdos, in the unity, and a lack of shalom, a lack of peace. Chodesh Tammuz is a very important month. The Gemara Rosh Hashanah, Daf Yud Aleph, tells us that Yosef HaTzadik was conceived on Chodesh Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. And Al-Pi Kabbalah, it's taught that nine months later, his mother Rachel gave birth on Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. There are other opinions that say it was another date in Chodesh Tammuz that he was born and he also died on the same date. It's the month where we come to rectify to redeem our errors and mistakes. And we say, Shalom will prevail. Peace is paramount. There's nothing more important and monumental than Achtos amongst the Jewish people. But Chodesh Tammuz is also the month when the Meraglim, the spies, went to spy out the promised land, the future Eretz Yisrael. And the Torah tells us, V'hayomim yimei, Bikuri Anovim. It was the days of the harvest of the grapes. But the Torah says, Anovim, a cluster of grapes. What is the significance of the cluster of grapes? A significance is so powerful and potent and important and so poignant. Because a cluster of grapes represents the fact that the Jewish people are like a cluster, interdependent, interrelated. As the Marali Prague says, we're one organism. We're one entity. And as long as we act as one, and we understand that we have to stand together, then we are impenetrable, then we are inviolable, and then we are impervious to any harm, even for the most brutal and mortal sworn enemies of the Jewish people. However, if we act fragmented and no longer as a cluster, and if we act divided and fractured, then we are vulnerable and susceptible. We are open prey to the barracudas who seek to consume us alive. The Holy Zohar in Chalik Bey says that the months of Nisan and Eor were given to the Jewish people, but the months of Tammuz and Av were given to Esav. And Esav has tremendous authority and jurisdiction over these months. Says the Heiliger of Shimshim from Ashtapoli, who Rachmal Islam was murdered al Kiddush Hashem in Tachvatat with his holy Kehila. Hayomim yemei bikure anavim. Bikure means preceding. But what comes first? He says, if you look at the letters anavim, which is spelled ayin nun veiz mem, it's spelled without a yud, deficient. He says, what are the letters? Bikure. What comes before those letters in Avim? The letter before Ayin is Samuch. The letter before Nun is Mem. 
The letter before Vez is Aleph, and the letter before Mem is Lamed. That spells out Samach, Mem, Aleph, Lamed, Samoel. Because in these months, Thomas and Av, the Sutton, Samoel, has tremendous power. He looks at us and he says, Are you acting, Jewish people? Are you acting in unity? Are you caring about one another? Are you being the car of each other? Are you acting distant and remote from each other? Or are you trying to be Makar of the Jew who may be disenfranchised, the Jew who may be unaffiliated, the Jew who doesn't know about his heritage? Or are you acting cold and not warm and inviting and encouraging and receptive? Are you creating shlemus, wholesomeness and completeness and peace? Or are you making a bold spot, a hole in the Jewish people? Are you deliberating before you say something to another Jew? Are you being chayker and pondering and probing and investigating? Or are you being rash and impetuous? Kairach was the first individual since Sinai to make an insurrection in Kala Yisrael and to cause them to be fragmented. And Kairach is an anagram. The letters Kairach are Reish Ches Kuf as well, which means Rachaik causing one Jew to be distant from one from the other. It's also the letters of Kerach, cold, ice, that tells the Jew, don't be warm. Be holier than thou, act superlious and arrogant, and don't care. Only if he's unzura, only if he's from our machina, our camp. Otherwise, who needs him? But what you create then is a karcha, again the letters of Kerach, a bold spot, a hole. That's why we have to be chayker, ches kuf reish, the letters of Karach. Look into a matz of a situation. Plumb the depths before you act in haste, before you regret what you do. It's so important. Sometimes when we act out of anger, it has devastating results. And we can't backtrack. We can't press the rewind button. And we can't press delete. The Heiliger of Moshe Leib of Sasov used to say that if you don't succumb and you don't capitulate to anger and you're able to conquer a bout of anger where you're going to get angry at somebody and cause pirud, cause division and separation especially at a whole population of other Jewish people that's more important, he says and that's greater than a thousand tainesim, a thousand fasts. The Tzemach Tzedek, the Holy Tzaddik, the Tzemach Tzedek used to say that before anyone could get angry, his practice was he would take out a Shulchan Aruch Yerdea because he said that if a person has a Shiloh and Kashras or an Isif Hetter, they wouldn't rule without consulting the Shulchan Aruch. The Medrash and the Zohar say, Anger is tantamount to idol worship. What greater Isra prohibition then anger. And you're going to get angry before looking at the Shulchan Aruch. The Heiliger Rabbi Yitzchak of Orky said that before he would get angry, he would go home and put on his special kaas or anger jacket. The rationale, the psychology behind that is so fascinating. Because in modern day psychology, they talk about the 10 second rule, the 10 minute rule. We have time to process your emotions, to think about things before they really unfold, and before something cataclysmic happens, and catastrophic happens, to rein in on your emotions, and to get calm. If a guy's in shul, and he's looking forward to his kichel and erring, and somebody takes it before him, and he's about to get enraged, and he's gonna cause pirud, and machloikas, machloikas is a contraction of two words. Mayach loikas, it means your brain, your mayach is loikas. It gets stricken, it gets paralyzed, it gets debilitated because when you get angry, your brain is not working effectively. That's what happens. So you go ahead and you have the 10 minute rule. You have to have your anger jacket. And you're able to calm down and you're able to relax a little. We are now, Claudius Roll is stuck between a rock and a hard place. We have a barrage of missiles poised, aimed at us in Eretz Yisrael. Baruch Hashem, Nisim and Aflos, Pilei Plum. 
the miracles that are transpiring right in front of our eyes. But it's not push, it's not simple. We're severely at risk. We're at risk of Khalil of Achas, God forbid a million times, a nuclear attack. And on the more domestic level, all the calamity and suffering and tragedies. And we look at life, and we look at the world situation, the matzav, and we say, it's truly a rock. A rock is inorganic. A rock is inanimate. Aside from some sedimentary rocks like charcoal and chalk, rocks have no life. Totally inanimate, totally inorganic, totally stagnant. Where in the world will life come from? Is there a Yeshua possible? Can a miracle come forth from a hard rock? And God says, Moshe says, yes. He told Moshe Rabbeinu, v'dibartem el hasela. You see that inanimate, inorganic, stagnant rock? Yesh tikva, there's hope. Yeshua's Hashem clarifying the salvation of Hashem is like the blink of an eye. Kavi el Hashem, give hope to Hashem because Hashem could do anything. V'dibartem, speak to that cellar because it looks like a rock. That's the exterior, that's the facade. That is the nigla, that's what's revealed. But in that rock, in every situation is the imprint, the insignia of God, and God could do anything for anyone. No matter how dire, no matter how bleak, no matter how ominous the situation, no matter how catastrophic it looks, He could change the rock into water. He could do anything. But all you got to do is vidibartim, speak to the Selah, and then you will peel away the layers. And the word Selah, the letters are Samach Lamed Ayin. If you speak... To the facade, if you speak to the exterior, you'll discover the panemius, you'll discover the nister, you'll discover what's really inherent, what's really intrinsic, what's really there. Because the letters Samach, Lamed Ayin, are only the exterior, but the interior of those letters, Samach, how is Samach spelled, the letter Samach? It's spelled phonetically, linguistically, how is it? It's Samach Mem Chaf. That means the interior letter of the letter Samach is Mem. Let's go to the letter Lamed. Lamed is spelled Lamed Mem Dalid. The interior of the word, of the letter Lamed, is a Mem. So, so far you have two Mems, and then the letter Ayin is spelled Ayin Yud Nun. The interior, the Pneumius, the Nister of the letter is Yud. So in essence, what God is saying with the Bartim al if you speak to the hard rock, what seems to be no hope, you get from it Mayim because it really spells the letters Mem Yud Mem. Azoizak, this is said by the Be'er Mayim Chayim, the Heiliger Rebbe, the Be'er Mayim Chayim, that in the Selah is really the Mayim. And that's true for life. And it's true for Neshamos. You look at Neshamos, I personally can't get over the Nisim and the flaws that are created in BJX and Brooklyn Jewish experience, seeing people that the facade is a rough exterior. And then when you peel away the layers, with the Bartim, when you speak to them, when you have a positive, happy, healthy countenance, and you take an interest and you show love and warmth, you peel away the hard rock, the cella, and in it is vibrancy. In it is a teshuka yearning. But that creates achdus when you reach out with the Bartim, when you speak. Moshe Rabbeinu's punishment was very severe. He was really castigated and lambasted for hitting, for striking the rock, as opposed to to speaking to the rock. And was his punishment, it was very punitive. But was it Mita Kenega Mita? Rabban Shalom says to him, I forbid you from entering the land of Eretz Israel. You cannot go into Israel. What's a shaykhus? What's a connection? How is it commensurate? The misdeed, the crime, so to speak, with the punishment. Eretz Israel is a very unique place. Let's go to 1967. 1967. Israel was an infantile, it was a baby, only 19 years old, the modern state of Eretz Israel. You had a puny amount of Yidden, of Jews there, surrounded by myriads and myriads, multi-millions of Arabs. Poor Israel, poor Eretz Israel, the Jews there. There's a war that's declared from Egypt, huge Egypt, the empire-like Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Algeria, Kuwait, Sudan financed with $3 billion. Now, $3 billion may not seem like a lot today. Right? We all have $3 billion in our bank accounts. $3 billion in 1967 was a lot of money. The United Nations peacekeeping troop that was supposed to be there to protect our very, very trustworthy friends, the United Nations, they flew the coop. 
They said, goodbye, Charlie. We're not interested in helping out. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol got on the radio and he was supposed to placate and soothe and calm and relax the people. And he breaks out in tears. He sees what's happening. It's a cell. It's a hard rock. Nothing could happen here. The Jews are dead. He orders the cemeteries to prepare mass graves. The Arabs called it, it's, it's a war of extinction, of massacre. And we know what happened. In a whirlwind miracle, not only did the Jews declare victory, but they reclaim after 2,000 years. Rabbi said, 2,000 years. They get back, Yerushalayim, the Kaisal Marabi, Beis Lechem, Rochli Menu, Marosa Machbil, they get back Hebron. Miracle of miracles. How? It defied nature. It transcended any rational explanation. Because Eretz Yisrael is not a place of striking or hitting. Eretz Yisrael is not about armaments. It's not about weaponry. It's not about artillery. Eretz Yisrael is a place of a departum. It's the words of Torah learning. It's the tefillos, the prayers that beseech and implore the Almighty. But more importantly, it's the words that the Bartim is speaking one Jew to another to make achdus, to be makar of other people. The biggest chus that we could do for Ayal, for Gila Mechoel, for Yaakov Naftali is to show achdus and the sheer is in their eternal memory. These holy kadoshim, el yonim, to make achdus for the Bartim to speak. Not striking, not hitting, but speaking. And Moshe Rabbeinu struck the rock. Rabbi Shalom says, no, that's not what Eretz Yisrael is about. Eretz Yisrael defies nature. It transcends. It eclipses any reality that we know. You don't need the armament. You don't need the artillery. You just need the words of Torah Tefillah, the words of Achdus. We seem to be now, though, in a very precarious position at a precipice an imminent war in Iraq that will involve probably the entire world. I find it so fascinating that the Gemara says in Psachim Daf Mem Zayin that Iraq is called Imon Shel Yisrael, the mother, the matriarch of Jewish people. You have to understand, Iraq is the cradle of human civilization. It's basically where most things started. According to some opinions, even Gan Eden has a connection of Shachas to Iraq because the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Why is it called Iman Shal Yisrael, the Gemara Sachim? There are some opinions that say because Avram Avinu, the patriarch of Kla Yisrael, was like the mother of Kla Yisrael. He came from there. He originated there. Others say because Iman, mother is a Lashon. The etymology is Emuna, faith. Because that's where faith came from because Avram Avinu started being the car of the world disseminating Hashem's precepts and teachings. The Gemara in Sanhedrin, the Flamel Chesma Bey says, that when Adam Marishon, the primordial man, the first human being was created, his head was extracted from the earth of Eretz Yisrael, but his body, his goof, originated and was derived from Babel, and his appendages, his limbs, and the rest came from all over the world. Some of Farshim actually, it's exceedingly, exceedingly intriguing, say, that Leka Dover Shalor Mizabarisa, everything in life is alluded to and encrypted in the Holy Torah. So, how is it alluded to in the Torah that the Mishnah, the Holy Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral law, that the Mishnah was written by Rabbi Huda Nasi in Eretz Israel? Because the head of Adam Rishon is representative and symbolic of the Mishnah, which is the head of Torah Shabbat Peh. The body, the Gemara itself, was written in Babel, like the body of Adam Rishon. And the Mephorshim are from all over the world. You have Rashi and the Polytoysis from Germany and France. You have Rambam from uh, Egypt and Spain. You have Maharam and the Marshal from Lublin. And you have people who are being Mechadish Torah on the Western Hemisphere every single day from all over the world. The Gemara in Ksubis, Daf Kuf Yud Aleph from Abay says that there's one place in the world that will be speared from Hevle from Mashiach from the tribulations and the trials of Mashiach and that's Hutzal Ben Yamin in Iraq. As a matter of fact, the Gemara Sanhedrin, Daf Sadechah says that a prelude to Mashiach coming is when Iran takes over and makes inroads in Iraq. What's this about? Why is Iraq so special? Why is it so pivotal? And why is it so important in the grand scheme 
of our destiny and our lives. It's a very interesting. The first monarch in world history that was able to vanquish and conquer the Jewish people, to displace and exile us from Eretz Yisrael after being entrenched and ensconced there for 850 years. The first man who attempted to decimate, basically, and was almost successful, Klai Yisrael, was Nebuchadnezzar Melech Babel, the king of Babylonia. 586 BCE. Well, Nebuchadnezzar attempted to eradicate the Jewish people. Baruch Hashem, of course, he was Matzliach, but there was a Nebuah that said that Babylonia, of which he was a monarch, it says will never be rebuilt, which is very, very mind-boggling because it seems that Iraq was rebuilt. And the Navi says in Yeshaya 48, Memchas and Yirmiyah Navi, Parak Nun, that it won't be rehabilitated, so to speak. It won't be rebuilt. However, how fascinating is it that the true Babylonia is really a city that's 53 miles from Baghdad. And that's where Saddam Hussein, in our generation, in our century, declared himself the reincarnation. He was obsessed and possessed with the personage, the personality of Nebuchadnezzar declaring himself the successor and the reincarnate of Nebuchadnezzar and that he will finish the job and obliterate the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, he excavated in Babylonia the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, 600 rooms and laid 60 million bricks with the insignia of his name and Nebuchadnezzar. He even made a hologram of he and Nebuchadnezzar together and had festivals where he named the festivals from Nebuchadnezzar to Saddam Hussein. But as Navi predicted and as alluded to in Targum Yonason, 70 years after being declared a modern state Iraq, it was basically the end. And if you go to modern day Babylonia, today's city, you will see it laying in ruination and devastation, there's nothing there just as the Navi predicted. Because Rabbi Shalom went ahead, as the Zohar says, he brings back the kings of old, especially Nebuchadnezzar. And he annihilates them forever. This is Babel. How amazing. But why does Babel have this Kedusha? What's it really all about? So the Medrash, Robin Baratius and Radal of Dabaloria say something fantastic that the Dor Flaga emanated from Bovel, the generation of dispersion. They were severely punished. But what did they have? The Pasuk says they had Safa Achas, one language and Devar Machadim, and one agenda, so to speak. And one of the interpretations on the Medrash is that the Torah Kedusha does not reveal to us the real reason why the Dor Flaga were so severely punished. And the reason for that is to honor them. Could you imagine? To honor the sinners. Why are we honoring them? Because they were devarim achadim. Because they had achdos and unity. The Torah doesn't disclose and reveal what they really did. To show them homage and respect. They were worthy and they deserved a unique honor. Because they demonstrated achdos. Their achdos was to defy God. It doesn't make a difference. They had achdos, and that's why the Medrash says there was still a vestige of them, whereas the Dora Mabel was totally wiped away because of achdos. You see, implanted in Babel was this power of achdos that we have to tap into, that we have to rediscover, and of course, to channel it for the right things, for achdos, for Yiddishkeit, for brotherhood, for peace. And this is how we could get out of our tsaras, out of our terrible, terrible, miserable situation in the world. The fright and the danger is through achdus, through Torah learning. The Maharali Prague says that every page of Gemara you learn, you create Gavriel, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel. Those are the Rashi Tavis of Gemara, Gimel, Mem, Reish, Aleph, Gavriel, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel. Chayna Hashem li Re'ah, Rabbi Hashem encompasses you and protects you by Torah learning. And the only one who Rabbi Hashem calls Ayhavi is Avram Avinu. He says, you are my beloved. And if you love someone, you do anything and everything for them. And you protect them. And that is how we get Shemira. Rabbi Hashem will say about us, if we reach out to our fellow Yidin, and we create Shalom, we create peace, and we make sure to only promote Achdus, 
The Rabban Shalom will say about us, I have he. he loves us. And if he loves us, nothing could go wrong. We'll have the ultimate shmira. We'll have the ultimate protection. And then that Be'er Shem will pave the way to Yibane Be'es Amigdash, to the rebuilding of the Be'es Amigdash, and to Mashiach Sekenu, the ultimate Mashiach, Ben Heirav Yameinu. Amen. Thank you for listening.